And if anyone who has not yet signed up to speak wishes to do so, you can sign up on the iPads out in the hallway during the presentation. All right, everybody, it looks like we're ready to begin the program for tonight. First off, can everybody hear me in the back? No? Good evening and welcome. 
I'm Patrick Taylor, the District 5 Outreach Coordinator for Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski Jr.'s Office of Community Engagement. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you here for our fifth Budget Town Hall series. As the County Executive has expressed, government work works best when our residents drive the conversation, and our signature Town Hall series continues on those efforts to create a more open, accessible, and responsive government. We keep building a better Baltimore County together by bringing you, all residents, to participate in our county's budget process. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Vincent Farm Elementary School Principal, Ms. Jamie Bazignani. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vincent Farm Elementary. My name is Jamie Bassignani, and I am the proud principal here at Vincent Farm. Our 15-year-old building supports 757 students in grades pre-K through fifth, as well as a regional special education integrated program. At Vincent Farm, we believe Okay, I'll use my teacher voice. All right. <laughs> Welcome to Vincent Farm Elementary. My name is Jamie Bassignani. I'm the proud principal here at Vincent Farm. Our 15-year-old building supports 757 students in grades pre-K through fifth, as well as a regional special education program. At Vincent Farm, we believe that all students will succeed. We welcome you to our very special school and invite you to become an active contributor in our future success. We hope that you enjoy your time here this evening and thank you all for coming. Tonight, we continue with fiscal year 2024's budget discussions in District 5 hosted by your county executive, Johnny Olszewski Jr. and your council member, Mr. David Marks. After the county executive's budget presentation, our residents will have an opportunity to share their budget related priority within the allotted time of two minutes at one of the designated microphones located here in the front of the auditorium. The county executive, the appropriate department head or councilman Marks will address your inquiries, concerns and ideas. If we cannot answer a question tonight, we will have a coordinator from the Office of Community Engagement follow up with you. Now, without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to welcome your councilman, David Marks. Well, thank you all very much. Um, it is a, a distinct pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I have always had the honor of representing engaged communities, uh, whether it's been in Towson or Kearney or Lock Raven, Perry Hall or Kingsville, and now I'm very fortunate to represent White Marsh, Chase, and Middle River. Uh, if you live south of Interstate 95, I've represented you for exactly two months, and I'm looking forward in particular to hearing your needs, challenges, and priorities, along with all the other speakers tonight. Uh, thank you to our County Executive, John Olszewski, for hosting these town hall meetings, uh, which reflect our ongoing and bipartisan effort to be more open and transparent. Our number one priority in Baltimore County is to protect our communities. And uh, nearly 30 years ago, you know, uh, more than 30 years ago, Eastern Baltimore County was hailed for its heroism in responding to the 1987 train derailment in Chase. Uh, I know we all look forward to partnering uh, on a long-term plan to address our career and volunteer fire stations. I'd like to thank our county executive for advancing the planning of a new Essex police precinct. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to building a modern, robust police force for our neighborhoods and businesses. I've personally spoken to many of the audience about your needs. And I know we're going to hear about things like traffic calming, particularly in the Bird River Road area, about a permanent home for the Glen L. Martin Aviation Museum, about local drainage and transportation projects, uh, and finishing the Gerst Road Park and turf improvements to Cowington Ridge Park. 
and I know many of you care about making the CP Crane Plant a protected park, and that's something that's going to particularly require effort at the local, state, and federal levels. In addition, there are many things that we're going to hear that are new tonight, and please speak up and tell us what's on your mind with regard to the planning of the next budget. Finally, I want to talk very briefly about development, although it's not related to budget, but I know some of you are here tonight. Um, the area south of I-95 is new to the 5th District, as I said, uh, which means that I am dealing with development issues that I inherited and projects that I sometimes opposed. Uh, right now, I'm working with community leaders to review the development plan at the Lafarge Quarry, and we're in interaction with the County Department of Planning on that project. I want you to know that I will do whatever I can to preserve open space, to build more parks, to protect our shorelines, and ensure that we focus our development efforts within Greenlee and older areas that need revitalization. So again, thank you very much for coming. I look forward to listening to all of you. And again, I appreciate the county executive and his staff for setting up such an open and transparent process. Take care. This is where the councilman gave me a roaring introduction, everybody. <laughs> um, I think everybody knows me. Um, I'm County Executive Johnny Olszewski, and uh, I, I first and foremost um, want to thank uh, Principal Bons Bonciani for hosting us tonight. Please uh, thank them, our hosts, for having us tonight. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank two of your other representatives who have joined us tonight. We're, we're joined by Delegate Nick Allen and Delegate Ryan Naraki, who are in attendance as well. Uh, and before we do a quick um, overview and, and presentation about the budget, um, I just want to thank Councilman David Marks. Um, we have been, um, we come from different parties, but we've never let that stop us from having uh, sincere, robust, honest conversations about how we can drive progress. And uh, I think he, he deserves, he deserves, yes. Um, Councilman Marks deserves a lot of credit. It's been, uh, it's been a real joy and honor to serve alongside him. Um, we haven't always, he hasn't always voted for everything I've sent his way. Um, and that's okay. I mean, that's how government's supposed to work. In the few times that we've disagreed, we've never been disagreeable. And uh, he's even pushed me and my administration to think differently about how we can advance uh, programs together. So I think that's how government's supposed to work. I think that's what people expect of me as county executive and of, of Councilman Marks as your councilman. So I just want to set, set the framework that I think these conversations are helpful, that we're also hearing directly from you. So with that, uh, I have a brief presentation. We'll get through that, and then we're, we want to open the floor up because I know there's a, a lot of attendance tonight. This is a real testament um, to all of you. So thank you for your presence, and thank you in advance for your advocacy. So let's talk a little bit about our budget. We've done a lot um, together these past four years. And whether it's opening up our government and having ethics reforms or creating the county's first ever office of the inspector general, something we've grown every year, um, creating the county's first ever 311 service, um, having our office of community engagement. You heard from Patrick earlier, who's your dedicated outreach rep representative. Uh, Mandy Remmel is here. She's the director of the, of the office. But we really have tried to make incredible strides forward so that government is more open, accessible, and connected to all of you. Because of how we've tried to open up government and change our processes, we've been able to overcome an inherited $81 million deficit. We've delivered one of the best public health responses to the worst public health crises of our lives. We've made record investment in public safety, education, and our infrastructure. And so these town halls have really been a big driver of all that work. Um, we always open up talking about where the money comes from and where it goes. Uh, money coming in. So over 65% of every dollar gets spent directly in our people. And over half of our budget is directed towards education. Um, BCPS gets over $2 billion annually from Baltimore County. We also spend significant dollars on CCBC and our libraries. Uh, our next largest investments are in public works and transportation, the roads, the sidewalks, the streetscaping, 
Uh, we have $470 million in public safety, and we pay for that largely through um, property uh, values and our income taxes. That's on the operating side, that's the day-to-day, -day, paying our people, having our contracts, then we also have the capital side. So on the capital side, um, about half of all of our money comes from our metro water fees. And about half of that money that comes in goes directly back out into paying for the water lines, the sewer lines um, that we really need. That's incredibly aging infrastructure, and we'll talk about water and sewer briefly later on. The rest of it largely comes from what's called general obligation bonds. Those are the bonds that you all voted for this past November general election, borrowing for schools, borrowing for parks, uh, borrowing for other, other investments. Um, there are other fees and federal funds that come in. And then on top of this capital budget, which is uh, over $3 billion over the next several fiscal years, and the operating budget, which is over $4 billion just this fiscal year, we leverage what's called pay-as-you-go, or pay-go funding to do capital investments. And what's nice about that is that it doesn't count against um, our limitations, which we're going to talk about um, the spending affordability that the county council sets for us when we submit our budget. So that is one of the things that um, is legally required every year. Um, Councilman Marks and his colleagues um, who serve on the spending affordability basically review the growth of our county or the expected growth our county will see, and they set the rate of growth which, with which they don't want to see our operating budget exceed. So things like, think about things like salaries, more positions, new programs, uh, et cetera. We take that information so that we give every department and every agency some targets so that we can responsibly invest in things like retiree health care, that we can strategically invest more in our people. Um, and then we use that um, as an example. So the current budget year that we're in, fiscal year 23, it's over a $4 billion budget. The growth factor uh, in this year's budget was 4.7%. And that allows for a growth of $107 million. Now, $107 million seems like a lot of money in new spending. Uh, but when you break it down and peel that back a little bit, we took, in this year's budget, almost half of that increase has been put into the salary of our employees, our teachers, our firefighters, our police officers, our general government workers. 25% of that increase has gone to things like retiree health care and increased costs there through OPEB and other insurance requirements. 17% goes through in required increases. In, um, think about things like gas and energy and other sort of built-in costs that we experience as a government. That leaves 13% for new programs. So again, even 13% of 100 million seems like a lot, but when you start thinking about what we heard at town halls, that goes really fast. Um, so what we invested this year, we had a lot of new English as a second language teachers that we heard loud and clear that BCPS was requesting. We also put in other counselors and school support staff to help with the social emotional needs of our children. We expanded our county ride service to Saturdays and extended the hours. We put in a second set of turnout gear for the highest responders of our volunteer fire departments. Uh, we created a green infrastructure division within the Department of Public Works and Transportation. And we created new reforestry divisions in our Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability. But that was it. Um, it, it. It got spent pretty fast. Uh, but it was also a direct reflection of what we heard from you. So speaking of schools, half of our budget, significant investment every year. Fiscal 23, the current fiscal year, $2.3 billion of county general funds going to Baltimore County Public Schools. If you account for the loss in enrollment, so based enrollment-based maintenance of effort, Accounting for the 4,000 students we're under since the pandemic hit, we increased our spending by $70 million under what's called maintenance of effort. That's the level that the state tells us we have to maintain a base bare minimum. We're $70 million above that in this fiscal year and $91 million above year-over-year -year spending. In the interim, uh, we also heard loud and clear that our educators wanted wanted to make sure that we were being competitive and keeping up. We announced a mid-year, pretty unprecedented agreement uh, where we funded both through one-time and ongoing expenses to further increase educator salaries. In partnership with Councilman Marks and the member of the council, members of the council, we have really moved from our educators being largely middle of the pack to among some of the highest paid teachers in the state. That's not to say that we want to stop 
Madam Principal, we're not done. Um, but we want to we wanna just set the stage that we have, we have really uh, invested record dollars into education in addition to hiring over 300 new positions. Again, even as we've seen enrollment decline by over 4,000 kids. Just to put that in perspective, uh, we're funding currently probably over three full new high schools worth of staff um, than we would uh, because of the, the enrollment reductions. Uh, moving forward, um, I've committed to the school system, even though there's some uncertainty about the economic future, that for the next four fiscal years, um, so long as I have a budget to submit, we will continue to do as a baseline at least $10 million more above that maintenance of effort for the next four years to continue our investments. We don't forget about the capital side. So we're in a really well-maintained, beautiful school. Uh, we want all of our kids to have that experience. So we have developed in partnership with the county council a long-term, over $3 billion capital construction plan. It's called the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Every school will see the benefit of this. We can go to the next slide. Um, so in addition to investing in STEAM and CTE technology and education, we're going to expand pre-K for over 8,000 new young learners who are, who are and should be entitled to pre-K under the Maryland blueprint. Um, we also have $16 million in this year's budget for security enhancements, things like cameras and security vestibules um, and replacing doors that need to be um, more, uh, promote a more safe environment. In District 5, um, that hundreds of millions of dollars of investment um, is happening all over the district. Um, school solutions for Cromwell Valley and Joppa View Elementary, a new roof at Harford Hills Elementary. We are opening a new Northeast Middle School, um, over $100 million of investment for the Northeast, um, a big, big push of the councilman. Maintenance upgrades at Kearney and Perry Hall Elementary, as well as Perry Hall Middle and High School. What's great about this plan is over the next 13, 14 years, it also will eliminate the need for trailers. Uh, we will actually have our kids inside the building in schools that have all had critical um, infrastructure upgrades. Um, we finally have bridged the gap on things like air conditioning, but that's the baseline, and I'm really proud of our partnership to make that happen. We know that school doesn't stop at K-12. Uh, we're very proud of our work in partnership with Councilman Marks and with his support and the council support. We have frozen in-county tuition at our community college. So CCBC has not seen an increase in in-county tuition for the four years we've been serving together. We've also expanded our college promise program for our youngest of learners from just over 100 students or so in our first year to over 900 this past fiscal year. I think we don't want to perform the HV Keystone correction. <laughs> Escape. There you go. Okay. Um, so in addition to schools, I mean, one of the things that we heard loud and clear from our, our, our town halls um, was the need to invest more in communities. And so one of the things that I'm most excited that has come out of these conversations is the return of bulk trash pickup in Baltimore County. And in our first year bringing it back, we have served almost uh, 70,000 homes across Baltimore County, and we've collected almost 2,000 tons of trash um, in this free bulk trash pickup service that's done twice a year, scheduled with you uh, and curbside. If you don't know when your pickups are, you can go online and type in your address on, on the website and uh, we'll be happy to make sure we come and pick up your stuff. We also heard loud and clear about the need for more code enforcement. Uh, we had a code enforcement workforce. We've hired eight new code enforcement officers. This is all part of that small little bit of growth that we get in the budget. Um, we now are going beyond just being reactive to complaints that come in and we're starting to work with community leaders to be proactive and do proactive sweeps so that we're talking to folks. We haven't lost track, as the councilman said, of what we expect to hear and we, we know is important. The bread and butter of things like uh, road resurfacing and traffic calming, uh, over $80 million um, this term, and we're going to continue making those investments as well. But again, all, all stuff that comes out of that very small uh, pocket. We know that we have to support our seniors. 
um, launching age-friendly Baltimore County Action Plan, um, having our No Senior Eats Alone Day, the Because program with the Weinberg Foundation where we go in and help our seniors age in place, committing millions of dollars to senior centers countywide, including funding for the capital funding for the Seven Oaks Senior Center parking lot expansion, which is underway. If you have questions, we're happy to answer tonight. I think the Department of Aging, is, along with all of our departments, are here for that. Uh, other investments specific to District 5, um, significant investments. Uh, again, I mentioned the water and sewer infrastructure. Over $300 million are being deployed in District 5 currently, um, including $11 million uh, in the Perry Hall community. Um, I know there was a, a sewer question and upgrade. I want to actually thank, she no longer represents you, but Senator Kathy Klausmeyer did a great job of helping to bring in some state funding so that we could bridge the gap in, in, in that particular place. Um, the construction of the Moores Lane Bridge is underway, and we're doing a replacement for Beach Road Bridge as well. This was a huge um, item from last year's uh, town hall. I want to thank all of you for your advocacy for this, but also this was one of the top priorities that Councilman Marks brought to us. Um, we are, have $2 million in the budget for the Honeygo Boulevard and Cross Road Roundabout. That is currently in the preliminary design phase but the funding is in place so that once the design is finished, we'll be able to continue. That's, again, a direct result of your advocacy and the advocacy of your councilman. Public safety has seen continued increases in investment. We've increased uh, more support staff. We put more school resource officers in the budget last year. Just over $28 million of growth these past two years. We're very proud that as we've seen spikes and increases across the country, Baltimore County saw a 36% decline in homicides last year. Uh, hat tip to the men and women of the Baltimore County Police Department. Um, <laughs> and on a, on a more personal note, um, we were reminded just how hard it is to do the work that they do. Um, when, I, when I visited um, one of our officers um, the night that he was injured um, and then subsequently, um, he knows that many of you are, are caring for him and praying for him, um, but it, it's just, just a, a sad reminder of, uh, you know, they all deserve to, to go home to their families too, and uh, to, to put that badge on and, and serve us. We just, we thank you, and uh, we appreciate what you're doing, not just every day, but to help keep us safe. Um, in addition to homicides being down um, significantly last year, uh, we also are proud that when things happen, we clear crimes. We find people who commit crimes and we hold them accountable. We have uh, significantly uh, higher than uh, the national average when it comes to clearance rates for homicides. Uh, we will continue making investments in public safety, uh, but we also recognize that public safety needs to be holistic. Uh, so we also have invested in things like mental health. We have a 911 clinician in our call center to help better divert calls as they come in. We've expanded our mobile crisis team to help people who are experiencing mental crisis. We're investing significant dollars, we'll talk about that briefly tonight, in recreation and parks. Historic funding to have more opportunities for our kids. We're investing to expand summer youth opportunities and our young people. We're, we're thinking about how job training and jobs makes a big difference for people too. So speaking of parks, um, one of the largest investments in Baltimore County's history, over 40 Five million dollars in capital projects being deployed across Baltimore County. Um, Councilman mentioned Gerst Road Park. We're cleaning some blight and undergrowth. Um, we're going to have a plan, I think, moving forward this year to take it to the next step. Miami Beach Park is being renovated and enhanced. Oliver Beach and Seneca Elementary, their multi-court purpose courts are going to be state-of-the-art amenities. Um, and we're looking forward to fresh, freshly painted lines at the beloved Sukup Area Indoor Pickleball Court. Had a chance to play pickleball with my friends at Jacksonville Senior Center for the first time, and I lost. <laughs> uh, in addition to our investments in recreation and parks, we're also expanding our tree canopy and our more urban uh, communities that have not had um, that investment through our Operation Retree program. We're bringing back um, glass recycling that was suspended back in 2013. That is now back in place. We are capturing methane, leaving our landfills. Um, so sustainability has also been on our agenda. Um, that's a lot of where we've been and where we are. Uh, moving forward, uh, just a couple of thoughts of what has been sort of 
my professed priority these next, this next term. Uh, one is around the issue of housing. We have legislation before the county council to do four things, and I uh, appreciate the councilman's openness to have conversations. Um, I, don't, I don't expect the councilman to vote for all four of my bills, uh, but I appreciate the ways in which he's engaged in dialogue, and there are some things he might support and other things he might not. Um, and I think, again, as we said at the top, that's good. Uh, but we're proposing four things. Uh, first, we're, we're proposing to create a housing opportunity fund so that we can make uh, attainable housing more available for all of our residents. So if you are someone who serves at a restaurant or if you're a teacher um, who makes less than $60,000 as a starting salary, you should be able to afford a house and we wanna have a fund that's dedicated to uh, ensuring that that's possible. We're also proposing the creation of the county's first ever definition of a vacant structure so that we can actually go in and do things like board them up and go after them and turn vacant houses into home ownership opportunities for residents and not have that blight in our communities. We're looking to update our townhome construction policy so that we can make housing more affordable just in terms of the size of the construction. And we're hoping to allow more family members to be able to live together uh, in units that are uh, attached to or near the house. So expand, expanding the definition of family to allow that for more family members and to allow more of our seniors to age in place. Uh, we're, our second priority this term is workforce. Uh, we're really looking at how do we break down the barriers for anyone who wants to have the opportunity to a high, play, high paying, high quality job. And one of the best examples was right out of the shoot, we announced a partnership with um, University St. Joseph uh, Maryland Medical System, UMS, uh, where they put in money. We use some of our recovery funding from the federal government. And we have a pipeline where we are taking some of our most vulnerable residents and creating a pipeline where they will become um, nurses within two years. They have guaranteed jobs with the hospital system. Um, we'll take them out of um, some of the challenges they're facing. And we're going to provide all the wraparound services to help them address things like childcare or transportation paying for classes because I think really the best thing you can give a person is a job. And if you give them a job, they can be self-sufficient and really create a future for themselves. And I'm excited about this partnership and we're hoping to replicate it. Last priority this term is capital. Um, I'm gonna hear a lot from you tonight. I think about investments in our amazing museum, preserving public land, um, more recreation space. I see you guys in the back. Um, but. That's, that's the third priority. So um, we really wanna keep making those investments so that we're investing in our police officers and our firefighters to give them the police stations and the fire stations they deserve, our senior centers, our libraries, and our community institutions. So um, we're gonna try not to not only finish the job that we started uh, by investing in some significant programs in the, in the beginning, but also listening and working with you to have more projects continue these next four years. So. Um, I'll just wrap um, on sort of capital and infrastructure. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, we had a historic announcement um, with the governor, the mayor of Baltimore, myself, representatives, and our House and Senate delegations, where we finally have a path forward to look at our water and sewer systems. I'm sure many of you have read in the news um, issues about boil water advisories um, or concerns about uh, what's been sent into Back River. Um, from the Back River Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, this is a, an agreement where um, it's actually since 1972. It's an agreement that's older than uh, the mayor or myself. Um, we don't still communicate with, uh, I mean, someone told the joke about like technology that was 20 years old and said we don't communicate with beepers anymore. Um, this is older than that. So we're really taking a holistic look about modernizing our billing, our governance structure so that we are modern, efficient, but also making sure that we're delivering quality services. So I'm looking forward to working with our delegation to have some recommendations on that. Uh, last point, and if you um, are, are caring about what's the sort of the future of this, we've got town hall meetings through March. I submit officially my budget to the county council on April 13th. Um, so in addition to these meetings, I'll have a separate meeting with Councilman Marks where he will sort of reinforce his priorities, which will largely align with yours. Um, council will do a review and they have to adopt the budget by the end of May. Before we open it up, uh, turn things back over to Patrick. Um, folks are passing out um, some papers, which you don't have to hold on to. You can share. And in fact, I think we've got such a large crowd, we're going to encourage you to share. Um, we're going to do a live poll. 
This is always a little fun and dangerous, but we like to sort of give everyone the chance uh, to democratize um, just sort of a sense of um, your experiences with county government and your thoughts around the budget. So if you have a phone, uh, I want to just pull up your picture function either on the piece of paper that's coming uh, and then punch the, the QR code. If you're close enough, you might be able to scan it on the screen. And then once enough folks have a chance to do that, we're going to open up, I think we've got just four or five questions, Mandy. Four questions. And then we're going to open the floor up. <clears throat> okay. So the first question is a pretty simple one. I mentioned that one of the first things that we did, oh, sorry, we jumped ahead. Okay, first question. This is um, our fifth year of the town hall series. Um, and again, I, I love that we're getting such great turnout um, five years in. I, I hope that's a reflection that the councilman and I are trying to be responsive. But is this, I'm just curious, like for how, how many of you, is this your first time coming out? How many your second? How many your third? Um, if you've got your QR code punched up, you can just tell us and then we'll show your neighbors. We've got 60, 70 votes already. It looks like a lot of first timers. If you're a first timer, can you raise your hand? All right, let's give a round of applause for our first timers. Yes. Um, I hope that some of those first timers become uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth timers. I guess second, third, and fourth is what we got left. But uh, we'll give it just one more second. But this is a really great showing by a lot of uh, first timers. 101 votes, almost 80 percent. That's great. Uh, I've seen five percent of fifth, if you're a fifth timer. Who's been here for all of them? Some staff members, some community members. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Uh, when it comes to investing in the core needs of the county, I would say that Baltimore County is investing too little, just about the right amount, or too much. This one feels a little more like a horse race. Need some like background music. So we're about 90 votes and too little and just about the right amount are pretty close. We've got 5% of you. 6% of you said too much. We'll give this just another 10 seconds. Okay, looks like we're slight win for just about the right amount with 115 votes. My, I think this is the last one. Um, two, one more for this one. Okay, so my top three budget priorities are, and I'm going to take this slide. Here we go. Uh, school capital, school operating, recreation facilities, green space, agricultural preservation, road resurfacing, pedestrian safety, public safety, housing and community development, workforce development. And just so you all know, uh, in addition to your comments tonight, the community engagement team is also collating the responses uh, to these live polls and we'll, we'll include that as part of the, the public record. This is all anonymous though, so don't worry. I guess I should have led with that. Uh, it looks like public safety is a pretty strong, along with recreational facilities, school, capital and operating, green space, are all over 40%. Five more seconds. Okay, very good. Last but not least, there it is. I mentioned 311 is a new service that we created. I'm just curious how many folks here have used 311? And if you haven't, so 311 is a is an, uh, one stop shop. If you want to call in a complaint uh, about a code enforcement issue, 
if you have a, a trash concern, if you have a question about your tax bill, um, do we have someone who wants to give the, the full run on 311? Uh, but yeah, any sort of like community need, uh, call 311, and if they can't directly answer your question, they'll make sure they patch you into the, the appropriate department. Um, so if you, if you need it uh, and you haven't used it, for the 80% of you who haven't, um, give it a try anytime you have an issue next time. We also have an app, um, Baltco Go. So while you're on your smartphones and you want to download that app, you can also register any concerns about things like code enforcement, trash, et cetera, um, via your app, Baltco Go, or 311. Very cool. Thank you all for... Uh, the time and attention. Uh, I know the councilman and I look forward to hearing from you. I'm going to turn things over to Patrick, I think, to, to Mandy to go over our plans for the night, and then we'll turn things over to you after the councilman gives a few minutes. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. County Executive. Uh, wonderful presentation. I did want to mention um, my legislative aide, Bradley Lang, is here as well. So if you want to, if so, there's something you don't, you don't get an opportunity to talk to me tonight, feel free to go up to Bradley. So thank you very much. Okay, good evening everyone. Before we start moving towards the mics, um, we just wanted to take a minute and let you know that there are two designated microphones here in the front of the auditorium. Um, we ask that when you come up to the microphone, you will have two minutes, which will be monitored by the clock here, uh, to state your budget-related priority or ask a budget-related um, question or share your budget-related idea. Um, we are asking that you please, we will give you a reminder at the 30 second mark um, that you have 30 seconds left and then the buzzer will buzz. Uh, you will hear a little buzz and we just ask you to please conclude your testimony at that time. Uh, there are a lot of individuals in here tonight. We're happy to see all of you. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, we would like to say that if you do hear the same community um, testimony or you hear the same project mentioned, um, please feel free when you come up, state if it's already been mentioned, state your name and you can state you know, that you um, support that priority uh, or if you have something new to share, you can add that as well. Um, and lastly, there are, um, for the, the groups that are here this evening, we ask that you have one representative from your group uh, share your budget related priority or idea um, and then if there are any documentations or if you have papers or posters or anything that you would like the executive and the councilman to have we will make sure that we can collect that at the end um, and get them to uh, the administration so uh, with that and just if, if you have something else to add it's okay to be with the same organization but I will also ask um, for anyone who is here representing an organization that's not planning to speak I'm going to ask you to stand so we can actually get a count of how many individuals we're here supporting. So um, again, like we don't want anyone to feel like they can't speak, but um, if you have something else to add relative to the work of your organization or your request, we welcome that, but otherwise we're happy to. Um, and then just lastly, before we start, I, re I realized we were joined by um, our board member, Julie Hen, who's also here tonight. So I want to acknowledge you, Julie, as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so if you are um, giving testimony tonight, you can go ahead and make your way to the microphones. We do have interpretation available if you need that as well. Thank you. Can I help you? That's me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for your speech. My name is Gustavus McLeod. I'm here representing the Glen Arrow. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yeah, can, you can you hear me now? Yep. I'm, my name is Gustavus McLeod. I'm here representing the Glen Arrow Martin Maryland Aviation Museum. I'm here to get support for the community. We'd like your help in creating a destination for over, for over 500,000 people to come to our county as visitors. Well, how, why will they come here? They'll come here to see what we did here, the achievements we made here, and the, and the history, the aviation history that was done here. Glen Elmark Museum has 98,000 square feet of artifacts. We've only had 1,200 square feet to display them. We have more artifacts by twice than any other museum in Maryland. The Lockheed Martin facility, they're leaving after 93 years. That loss to the community can be turned around. We'd like to take that loss and, and make a destination for our community. Through the efforts of Maryland Aviation Authority, we're going to inherit the Lockheed Martin building. We'd like your help to take advantage of this opportunity by a million dollars to get our collections in order. 
Okay. How do we come to our figures? Boeing's Museum of Flight in Seattle, they see over 700,000 people a year in their museum. We have a bigger collection, a better story to tell, and a deeper history. You know, they say the Wright brothers invented the airplane, but we built it at Middle River. <laughs> and the people at Middle River deserve this. It's our heritage. It's who we are. People should know who we are. And, we, and we'd like you to negotiate with Lockheed to get the rest of that property that they're leaving to be the, a community space for this heritage. And I'd like everybody who's, just, who's supporting the Glen R. Martin community and the Glen R. Martin Museum to stand, please. If, if you could hold sight, Manny, can you just get a count and put it in the... Yeah, especially if you're not going to speak, I want to make sure that we have a count of folks who are here um, to support the museum and its ask tonight. Okay, get up. As, get up. as Mandy is doing that, um, I, also will just, I also will just say, in addition to an incredible history, you, you guys put on a fantastic train garden as well. My daughter has enjoyed it several, several years now. So, <laughs> Send more money, we'll do a better job next year. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and yes. you, know, you know, we're really honored, uh, privileged in this area. We're intermodal, right? We've got the train station, we've got roads, we've got water, and we have a wonderful aviation history. So thank you all for caring about that heritage. Okay. Buenas tardes. Gracias por permitir de estar aquí en este momento. Y este, estoy muy agradecida por, por hablar con usted, señor Ejecutivo John. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank you for allowing us this moment, and I'm very happy to speak with you. He escuchado todos los programas que hay para niños con discapacidades. Como usted sabe, yo tengo una niña. I have uh, heard everything about programs that you have with the disabled, for disabled children. As you might know, I have a daughter. Me gustaría que, este, si es posible, que haya algunos este, um, centros de re, uh, para que reciban terapias los niños aquí como terapia de, de la habla, terapia de ocupacional. I'd like to see some uh, centers treatment centers where they might get uh, therapy, like speech therapy. Porque yo sé que hay muchos programas, pero fuera de, de aquí del condado, hay en Prince George, hay en este Laurel, en Bethesda, hay varios lugares donde hay servicios, pero menos aquí. I know that there are services of that type in other counties, like Prince George's County, Laurel, Bethesda, but there are none here. Y muchas de las veces nosotros no tenemos transportación para ir hasta allá. Y como ve, la niña con necesidades especiales, este, ella este, se molesta por mucho eh, tiempo en el transporte. Many times we don't have transportation, but uh, also uh, it's very far and the, uh, my girl then becomes uh, rather upset with the length of time spent uh, in tr uh, being transported. Y me gustaría que tome en cuenta mi petición. Muchas gracias. So I'd like for you to take into consideration my petition. Thank you so very much. Gracias. ¿Cómo se llama para todo? Mi nombre es Justina Mendoza. Good evening. My name is Ray Reiner, uh, resident of Oliver Beach. I am illegally blind, so I did not drive here. My, my good neighbor, Bernie Knox, here uh, brought me, and uh, she would like to read uh, a, a paper of our thoughts. What can be done at this point to eliminate the PUD, the PUD, from the Lafarge property on Earls Road? and to put into the county budget 
using possibly federal, state, and county funds to purchase to, for the purchase of the Lafarge property and the CP Crane property to enhance Marshy Point Nature Center. Thank you. Now I'd like to say that Marshy Point Nature Center was purchased by the county probably about 30 years ago from our former county executive, Don Hutchins. And uh, my wife was part of the uh, gunpowder uh, nature uh, planning board, and they took him on a cruise around the shorelines. And uh, through that, they were able to convince him to think forward and purchase 500 acres on the uh, gunpowder or uh, saltpeter creeks, uh, Dundee saltpeter creeks. And uh, now we have that beautiful nature center down there, which is the jewel of nature centers as far as the east side of the county. It's the only nature center in Baltimore County that's on the water. And we would like certainly to see that enhanced by purchasing the Lafarge property. I was appalled at the fact that our former county council person, against the wishes of 20 community organizations, put that PUD on the Lafarge property. So hopefully that could be changed and maybe purchased by the county with possibly state and federal funding and also the uh, CP Crane property. And by the way, uh, someone mentioned about uh, seniors, I th think I'm probably the oldest one here, 95 and 13 days. Woo! Way to go. Somebody said, what's that old guy doing here? He should be in better in a nursing home. <laughs> Thank you for your time. So for those of you who do not know Mr. Reiner, he is a real institution in this county. And uh, Ray, I want to thank you for your long years of advocacy and uh, the contributions you've made to the east side. Um, regarding the Lafarge plan unit development, I voted against extending public water to Earls Road in August. I voted against the plan unit development in October. Majority of the county council disagreed with me both times. As a councilman, I now have consequences of those votes. There will be a community input meeting one week from tonight at the Gunpowder VFW at 7 o'clock where you can come and offer your opinion. I have formed a task force of community and business leaders from the area that's looking at options for that site. We will have an opportunity as a county council to now look at the resolution and change it modify it or kill it. The only, I think we deserve that type of in-depth look at that property because to be very frank, I would love to have that as a park. I would love to have CP Crane as a park and I've also taken steps to slow down any development there as well. But there's limited resources and we're gonna need help from the federal and the state governments as well to purchase all this property and also Lafarge's private property, so they have to be willing to sell to us. The thing I do not want to see at Lafarge is 2,000 apartments at some point in the future. So we have, to, we have to be very clear, very deliberative, and think through the process. That's what I'm trying to do as your council member. I'm trying to slow down the development and be much more thoughtful in how we grow. But Ray, thank you for speaking tonight. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And we, we expect to see you again. We look forward to seeing you again next year as, as well. Um, if I could just sort of chime in and, and just add to what the councilman said, um, in addition to the council continuing to look at um, the underlying zoning that's permitted under the PUD, um, I know that the Department of Planning is currently reviewing um, some of the submissions that, that came in the wake of um, on the Lafarge property in, in wake of the passage that the councilman mentioned he voted against. Um, I don't know if Director Lafferty or someone is here. Um, in the initial responses from, you can stand up Steve, I'll give you a microphone. Um, I'll let Steve speak through it, but, but the department um, as part of the development review process, uh, in addition, um, 
has expressed, I think, some of the concerns that the community has, has mentioned, um, which would be part of, ultimately, if, if the PUD isn't changed, would be part of an administrative law ju judge's review would have to consider some of the input from the planning department. I hope that's right, Steve. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Mr. County Executive, I never correct you. Um, just to build on what you said, though, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, what a terrific crowd. Um, obviously, the Lafarge property presents a lot of challenges as well as a lot of opportunities. Uh, they have submitted a uh, community, uh, the first step going to a concept plan. Uh, we had extensive comments on that. Uh, we are hoping that they will be responsive and understand the significance of this site. Um, but they're in their very early stages. Because it is a PUD, it does not have the same restrictions on the zoning or the uses that can happen on that property. Um, but as we work with them and work through what the real challenges are, because it is a, a site that's being reclaimed, you know, they have to have a reclamation plan from the state, for instance. Uh, but we also know that Ebenezer is constricted, Earls is constricted. Uh, so there are a lot of limitations, even for the uses they propose. But we're going to continue to hold fast to make sure the community's concerns are taken into account as we keep moving forward. Thanks, Steve. And then I'll just, on the second piece of that, and this is, I know there's a lot of folks who are here uh, as well for CP Crane. Um, as the councilman mentioned, I mean, both of these parcels are privately owned. Um, I am more than open to uh, working with um, the community and the councilman to identifying local resources to apply towards the preservation of part or all, uh, depending on what we're able to work out. It sounds like there's candidly a, a more openness to uh, potentially doing something at the CP Crane site in terms of a, a sale to the government. Um, so we will certainly pursue that and have conversations around that. Um, but, but clearly, we're, we're happy to provide some of the resources. I would just echo the councilman's sentiments, particularly if you're talking about both sites. It's a significant amount of money. So we are also talking to our state and federal partners um, to see what solutions might be out there working with all of you. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Carlos. Uh, good evening, my name is Sardos. Una vez más estoy aquí representando a mi comunidad. Once again, I'm here representing my community. Y yo estoy abogando por clínicas de salud. And I'm asking for um, health clinics. Porque sabemos que nosotros no tenemos derecho a un seguro médico porque somos indocumentados. Because I know that we do not have the right to health insurance because we are not documented. Pero con la pandemia nosotros hemos sido los más afectados y la más de mi gente que es la que ha fallecido por el COVID. But during the pandemic, we were the most affected one and the ones that bore the highest death rate. Y nos, nosotros no tenemos el lujo de perder un día de trabajo porque no nos alcanza el sueldo. Tenemos que pagar renta y tenemos que pagar biles. Because we cannot, we do not have the luxury of skipping a day of work because we get paid for what we work. Y no vengo a exigirle, simplemente vengo a pedirle de favor que hagan algo por mi comunidad porque nosotros pagamos impuestos y aquí están mis impuestos y aquí tengo los demás. Aquí están todos mis impuestos de los años que he estado aquí viviendo y yo tengo derecho a una clínica de bajo recurso, porque muchas de las veces no podemos pagar un bill tan caro. And here are my taxes because I pay taxes every year that I've been here and uh, we cannot afford to pay full rate for health services. We need discounted services. Muchas gracias y espero que realmente hagan por mi comunidad algo porque realmente estamos sufriendo demasiado porque no tenemos salud. Necesitamos chequeo médico. And thank you. I hope that you will do something for our community because we are suffering a lot. We need medical checkups. I'm Dave Trussello uh, from Towson. 
uh, the Baltimore County Coalition of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, a volunteer organization, is proposing a Truth and Reconciliation Park in Towson, Maryland. The park and the activities presented there will inspire learning, healing, and vigilance for social equity in Baltimore County. In 1885, 15-year-old Howard Cooper, an African-American resident of Towson, was convicted of assault and rape by a jury that had deliberated for less than a minute. Before his attorneys could file an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, a mob stormed the old Towson jail and lynched him. On May 8, 2021, the coalition, in collaboration with the county and the Equal Justice Initiative, dedicated a historical marker at the site. Dignitaries in attendance at the unveiling included former Governor Larry Hogan and County Executive John Ruszewski. County Executive, we continue to appreciate the support you expressed for the idea of the park in your public comments that day. We are now ready to move forward and on further collaboration, including the challenges of funding uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Park. The coalition, along with participating civic and faith organizations and community associations, has the capacity to contribute to fundraising, educational efforts, to participate in the design process, and to involve hundreds of county residents in the work to create, maintain, and sustain the proposed Truth and Reconciliation Park. Thank you. Thank you. I think you guys are all connected with Savitra Peoples in the executive office, and, and also if Savitra, if, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some questions too. So uh, Bob Smith, the director of Rec and Parks, if you could just wave to everybody, he's probably gonna be very popular tonight too. So <laughs> we'll make sure if you're not connected with Bob as well, we'll do it. Thank you very much. Muy buenas noches a todos. Good evening, everyone. Muchas gracias por permitirme como Latina estar aquí en presencia de todos ustedes. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here as a Latin, as a Latina in, pre, in your presence. Soy una madre soltera que ha tenido la idea de crear una página para ayudar a la comunidad a estar informada. I'm a single mom who had the idea of creating a page to keep the community informed. De todos los recursos que hay aquí en Baltimore, en el condado y las afueras. Of all the resources that exist here in the county and away from the county. Una de las preocupaciones más grandes que tiene la comunidad es que no hay intérpretes o no hay there aren't uh, interpreters or or prof, uh, bilingual teachers comprendo que el idioma nativo aquí es el inglés pero la comunidad latina está creciendo i understand that the native language here is english but the latin community is growing Y como contribuyente que soy, desde el primer año he pagado mis taxas y estoy al día en todo lo que corresponde a la ley. So, but I am a taxpayer and since I've been here, I have paid all my taxes and I'm up to date with everything that, uh, that the law requires. Le pediría que tuviera en consideración el poder poner más profesorado en las escuelas, en institutos, ya que hay muchos estudiantes que quieren salir adelante. So we would appreciate you putting more teachers and other um, uh, support personnel because there are many students that would like to go get ahead and do well. Y que a lo mejor, pues sus padres no pueden permitirse pagar un profesor particular para poderlo nivelar y de esa manera poder obtener un gran, una gran carrera. And many parents cannot afford to pay a private teacher to get them up to level and in that manner be able to have a great career. Pienso que el primer paso para que Estados Unidos crezca es la educación y si no hay una educación equilibrada, pues... No sabemos cómo vamos a terminar. 
So I believe that one of the things that would be great for the United States to be able to progress is to have a good, balanced education. Without it, we cannot tell what the future will bring. Ante los ojos de fuera del mundo, como consideran a países tercermundistas, Estados Unidos es el país de las oportunidades. Demostremos, o le pido por favor, que nos ayude en este caso. And of all the countries in the world, the United States is looked upon as a leader by the second uh, tier uh, countries. So we all look at the states as a land of opportunity. So I'm hoping that we will rise to that level. Muchísimas gracias por darme la oportunidad y que viva Estados Unidos. Thank you very much for this opportunity and long live the United States. Gracias. Uh, so there are two folks. I, I know one is here. So first, I don't know, uh, I want folks to um, meet Juliana Valencia Banks, who's our immigrant affairs coordinator, who's also leading a lot of our language access work. So I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. And then I also, on the schools front, we added um, the 40 or so um, English as a second language teachers in last year's budget, largely because of what we heard from many of you and other education advocates. I don't know if um, Dr. Mary Boswell McComas is here from BCPS. She had been attending other, uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit, um, Doc, about sort of the thought in terms of moving those supports back into the community if you were here as well. But we'll let Juliana go first and then we'll see if Ejecutivo del Condado Chesky, Concejal Marx, muy buenas tardes. Muy buenas tardes a toda la comunidad que nos está escuchando. Gracias por venir acá. Eh, mi trabajo es servir como un puente entre la comunidad inmigrante, toda la comunidad inmigrante y el Condado de Baltimore. Parte del trabajo también quiere decir asegurarnos que estamos cumpleño, cumpliendo con la ley de Título 6. ¿Qué quiere decir esta ley? Esta ley quiere decir que cualquier programa que reciba dólares federales, debe de proveer asistencia lingüística sin costo alguno a los miembros de la comunidad y sin ninguna discriminación. Si usted siente que en su escuela o en una organización sin fines de lucro no están proveyendo servicios de lenguaje, hábleme, están rompiendo la ley. Good evening, County Executive Olszewski, Councilman Marks, everyone here. My name is Juliana Valencia Banks. I serve as Baltimore County's first Immigration Affairs Outreach Coordinator. It is my extreme privilege to serve as a bridge between all of our immigrant communities, county government, and the different organizations that serve them. Part of my job is also ensuring that the county is compliant with Title VI, which requires that any organization, county entity, nonprofit organization, or the like that receive federal funding are complying with Title VI, which requires that language access services be available to folks with limited English proficiency. So, if there are community members here that feel that an organization or a government agency or school where they participate or have children at is not language access compliant, please come see me so that we can address the issue. Thank you very much. Good evening. Buenas tardes. My name is Anna Weisberg. I'm a reading teacher at Deep Creek Middle in Essex. I, sorry. I was hired as a reading resource teacher. Instead, I am filling the hole left by a novice grade six reading teacher who left three weeks into the school year for a non-teaching job. Once, when I was able to do my job as a resource teacher at a high need school, I was doing small groups in a first grade classroom. A boy walked over to me and asked quietly, would you teach me to read? It was Devin's second year in first grade. I had time to do my job. I added Devin to my schedule 
and supported his uncle with home practice work. Devin finished first grade with the highest reading scores in the entire grade. I left Devin knowing he was going to be successful as a student and we, his community, would reap the benefits of his evolving awesomeness. Right now, I do not have the capacity to meet the needs of the Devons, the kids who need that little something extra to find their strength and meet their potential. We know that Baltimore County's population has diversified over the past 10 years, yet BCPS has spent less per student annually once inflation is taken into account. Our county needs you to develop just an equitable budget that truly reflects our educational values and meets the county's evolving needs, a budget that will allow us to recruit and retain the staff we need for every Devon so that they and we, Baltimore County, can thrive. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We heard a little bit on PUDS already, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the property at the North Point Government Center. And this sign was made by Kevin Hatfield and um, actually talked about in a PUD meeting uh, with the developer, Len Weinberg. And uh, Len Weinberg was asked if he would sell the residents of Baltimore County a piece of his property for a loss of $20.25 million. And his answer was, no, sir. So um, this, this process has only went halfway through that I know. Um, we're not getting the transparency on this that we need. So they're about halfway done uh, on this that, that I'm aware of um, because the police station is open. But then um, we still have another $5 million on roads and easements. We have another million dollars on a turf field that is up in the air. Things go back and forth. And the, it's been renegotiated, and it's gotten worse, to be quite honest with you. Um, so uh, then we have a million dollars for incidental cost. And we still have the tactical squad at the North Point Government Center. We also have the K-9 unit there because they didn't have room to move them. And actually at the North Point Government Center, we had room to expand for the police department. And I can tell you that we had over 7,000 signatures in the community that were opposed to the sale. And they kept moving forward. And the county executive is still trying to move forward. And he's saying that he has some kind of lease or contract or something. I've never seen it. And I was furnished all the paperwork that I have right here that um, uh, the community had, they, they gave it to me so I can wind up making a presentation about this. So it's been a bad deal since the very beginning. I don't have any more time, um, it seems. But, but, but the, real, the real deal is that at the very end of this whole thing is that if this property sold and we need a new school, we need more property, I'm putting things together and looking at the cost of the new schools and things of that nature when, and putting the property on top of it, I would not be surprised if this deal that they were saying was going to be $2.1 million that they bought renegotiated and um, actually the developer may be paying about a half a million dollars and it could cost the taxpayers somewhere in the neighborhood, my estimation, of, with a, for a new school, new property, $250 million. So I would like anybody to raise their hand that thinks this is a good deal. Okay. I thought that was going to be the response I got. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. God bless America and all of our patriots. Good evening. I'm Lloyd Allen, special educator in mathematics and TABCO board of directors member. Speaking on behalf of Cindy Sexton, TABCO president and elementary school librarian. You have heard Cindy speak, so you know her priority is retaining and recruiting educators to BCPS. TABCO believes that a properly staffed school will help improve learning outcomes, 
and help address discipline concerns. We can't appropriately and effectively meet the needs of our students when we don't have the staff. It's impossible. While BCPS has made strides in increasing salaries, we still rank ninth in the state in career earnings. What we need as a step in the right direction is the salary scale compression that we won with BCPS last school year. That is our budget priority, an historic restructuring of our salary scale so Baltimore County can compete with the other school systems in Maryland so our students can have the best opportunities for successes. A healthy school system means a healthy county. People move to locations because they want their children in the schools there. Property values rise, money is brought into the county, and the rising tide raises all ships. Our students, indeed the very future of all of us, our students are the priority, must take care of them and do all we can to prepare them for whatever future they choose. And that starts by making sure that they have the educators they need. Please fund our salary compression. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gus Themelis. I am here on behalf of White Bar Council. Um, and the reason I'm here is to respectfully ask that Cowington Ridge Park be turfed. Um, there are three very important reasons to turf this park. The first is uh, White Marsh Rec Council lost a lot, lost several fields due to the new middle school being in Ham Park. Um, the second is this park is an amazing park. There's already lights there, um, it's, but it's kind of like in a fishbowl, and it is always wet and muddy. Um, there's been several efforts to correct the drainage, and it has just not been able to be corrected. Um, and the, the third very important reason is, is that this would benefit our community tremendously. White Marsh Rec Council is one of the largest rec councils in, in Baltimore County. Um, there are literally thousands of kids that are a part of this that would benefit from this. This park already has lights there. Um, it would be used five nights a week three nights from six to nine at the very least, and then on weekends. It's um, within the White Marsh Rec Council, it's literally a five minute drive from just about everybody in the whole White Marsh Rec Council. It's so centrally located. Perry Hall White Marsh is a program run by volunteers like myself. Um, it's, it's my honor to, you know, if everybody could stand up that, that are here with me. I coach my daughter's teams. Um, my one daughter is uh, nine years old. My other's 14 years old. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's a, my pleasure to, to do this because um, we give back to the kids and they learn all the, the li life lessons that come along with playing sports. And we do it in a positive way. We give back to the community. I want to highlight that Senator Jennings has supported this program and has requested a $250,000 bond in state funding. Councilman Marks has been a wonderful ally in, in helping us uh, do the, the groundwork and getting this together. So I know you got a lot of important decisions to make here, and I understand. But if we could have the kids run and get a quick picture with you both, that would be Absolutely. really great. All right, thank you. Good. Let's go get a picture. Thank you. All right. Good picture. Come on. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Come on, Joey. And what a, what a life lesson. Thank you all for coming. All, all the young people here tonight, that's great. Thank you all for coming. Uh, before we excuse our young people who probably have earlier bedtimes than most of the rest of us, um, if any, do any of you want to talk about your, like, I just want to make sure if any of the, if our young folks want to, I think it's great. Um, let's give another round of applause for our young people for showing up. Um, I just wanted to make sure if any of you have, if you, any of you want to take 30 seconds and talk about the teams or what plan, if, if not, that's okay. But thank you guys for coming. Um. And to all the coaches, as, as the parent of a feisty seven-year-old uh, ice skater, basketball player, soccer player, thank you for the time that you put into our kids. 
Um, I make it to her games, but unfortunately, I only get to like fill in coaching every once in a while. So I don't. But but really, it's awesome that you guys do that. So thank you for your presence and for all you do. And I, I think I introduced uh, Delegate Iraqi earlier, but he has officially arrived, so uh, folks will need, need to catch him tonight as well. So thanks, Delegate. Good evening, County Executive Olszewski, Councilman Mark, and everyone. My name is Yvette Hicks, and I'm a member of the Bounty Baltimore County Commission for Women. In 2021, our county experienced over 3,000 domestic violence calls for help, 3,000 incidents of child abuse, 1,000 sexual assaults, 10,000 domestic violence homicides, and our second in reported child sex, sex trafficking. Our current response to families experiencing trauma may include medical exams, police reports, legal representation court cases, case management, counseling, and shelter all siloed services throughout the county. Baltimore County Commission for Women is asking the county leadership to bring together all affected parties, to reimagine a service delivery system for victims of trauma that is a roadmap to resiliency and restor restorative justice. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Peter Forrest and I'm here to request Baltimore County to set aside funding uh, for disc golf in Baltimore County. Um, disc golf is one of the fastest growing sports in America right now. Baltimore County has one course, I repeat, one course in the entire county of, uh, of Baltimore County. And and the kicker is it's 42 years old, too. So it was the second oldest cor uh, course in the state of Maryland. It was built in, or installed, I guess you would say, in 1981. Uh, so I think that's long overdue for us to get a second or third um, course built uh, or installed in uh, Maryland. Um, disc golf courses are relatively inexpensive. Um, the cost is around $1,000 per hole. Um, that's including like a basket and a tee pad to throw off of. So you're talking about like eighteen dollars to $20,000 for an 18-hole golf course. Um, so relatively cheap compared to other sports. Um, disc golf is also a, a very small footprint. Um, unlike soccer and ba uh, baseball fields where you have to level and grade and install everything, disc golf can be tailored and, um, and designed according to the, um, the layout of, the, um, of whatever field or wooded area that you're using. Um, disc golf builds uh, local communities uh, and encourages uh, outdoor activity that we saw a huge spike um, in the COVID. Um, you know, pandemic lockdown where people were going outside and seeking outside activities. Uh, it encourages families uh, to connect and be able to play together. Uh, it creates a local scene for, um, for players to connect with one another um, and create neighborhood clubs and groups. Um, it brings foot traffic to local businesses. Um, it, and it uh, gives us the ability um, to host charity fundraisers. Um, we are specifically looking for uh, the properties at Days Cove and also at Mount Vista Park. Um, I think those would be great uh, disc golf courses um, to install. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm going to turn, uh, I'm going to, I am going to give uh, Director Smith an opportunity. I, I think we actually put some money in the budget last year to start work at uh, Dave's Cove, and if it's as, if it's as affordable as you say, we should be able to get it done um, with what was already budgeted. And I know that we're also we are also looking at Mount Vista, but Director Smith. Uh, yes, sir. You are correct. Uh, we have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars allocated in the budget for design uh, for Dave's Cove, and we are scheduling a public input meeting for April.
Hello, thank you very much for providing the opportunity for input today. My name is Kim Paws Tucker. I'm executive director of Gunpowder Valley Conservancy, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of GBC as well as the Baltimore County Land Trust Alliance um, in support uh, of your land preservation initiatives in Baltimore County. Um, state, national, and global leaders are currently calling for uh, preserving 40% of natural lands by 2040, and Baltimore County is already well on our way to achieving this really uh, ambitious goal um, with approximately 28% of our lands preserved as farmland, parks, and recreation areas, so that's really great. Um, but in order to get to 40%, that's going to take continued commitment from uh, the county government as well as uh, other governmental organizations, and we appreciate the previous support um, for this program in the past. So as you know, preserved land uh, is important for ecological benefits, but also for human health and public health benefits as well. Um, as the gentleman was speaking about before, opportunities for recreation, uh, but also preserved farmland ensures that our residents have access to local farm goods uh, and value-added agricultural products. And something that GBC is specifically interested in is clean, uh, clean water, clean streams, and fresh, clean drinking water by protecting our reservoirs. Um, overwhelmingly, Maryland residents support open space, according to uh, prior polls. And the BCLTA asks that, uh, the, uh, and I provided a handout, um, but the BCLTA asks that uh, the county dedicate 1% of the capital budget to land preservation programs, um, increase emphasis on acquiring and maintaining accessible parkland within the Ertl, commit to continued funding of the BCLTA, uh, increase the current agricultural land preservation goal, fund environmental improvements on preserved land to include stream buffers and invasive species controls, Ex two more, uh, extend the current five-year property tax exemption for land owned by land trust and increase the protection of corridors for recreation and wildlife. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Hello, my name is Ben Church. Thank you, um, Mr. Olszewski, Jr. and Councilman. I'm also representing Disc Golf. Uh, by this time next month, we will have formed a certified not-for-profit representing Baltimore County Disc Golf. It is a rapidly growing sport. It's been played for a very long time, but over the pandemic, it has exploded. Um, the kids love it. Everybody, uh, entire families can play. We're excellent stewards of the land. We pick up trash. We maintain fallen trees. Um, and we do everything in our power to keep the parks that we utilize clean. What we're asking for is to partner with the county more closely to develop access and um, also certain amenities such as bathrooms, porta johns, and trash cans. We do not have enough trash cans on the parks in this county, and that means that people throw trash on the ground. Um, we would like a way to where we can also partner with the communities to have more clinics for children to get into the sport, to create more dynamic offerings for sport for children because the ball fields are great, but they are ball fields and you know there's other things there. Um, disc golf gets kids outside and it's also a great way for kids to exercise. The average disc golf round, you walk about five miles. So it's excellent for heart health. And it's really good for um, just general activity. It's good for all ages. And if the county can promote and provision uh, funding for it, it will mean that there will be access that will be affordable and more or less free for people to utilize anytime they want. Um, and if you would like more information, please keep an eye out for Baltimore County Disc Golf. It'll, we're still working on the name. Uh, but uh, we are going to um, uh, create a certified not-for-profit. And we hope that you all will uh, also help us champion this great sport of ours. Thank you very much. County Executive, good evening. <laughs> County Executive, good evening. Uh, my name is Pat Keller. I'm president of the Perry Hall Improvement Association, and I'd like to do something that we probably don't do enough for you, and that is to thank you uh, for some of the projects that you've done in the Perry Hall area specifically funding for the traffic circle at Honeygo Boulevard and Cross, thank you very much. The new Rosedale Elementary School, thank you very much. The new elementary school, desperately needed, thank you very much. 23-acre Gers Park, thank you um, uh, very much. And also thank you for your uh, con continued support of the Veterans Memorial Project we're working on and hopefully the, the White Marsh Mall Task Force. 
um, as, it, as, it, as it works through it, its system. Um, we do have a couple projects that are still outstanding. One you mentioned, the Moores Lane overpass, and that's been uh, promised uh, every year for the last 30, I believe. But it sounds like you're uh, moving pretty uh, well with that, and we appreciate that and keep that effort moving. The other is the full interchange at Route 7 and, uh, and Route 43, uh, White Marsh Boulevard. I realize these are both state highways, um, but perhaps we could give them a push um, you know, to do a little bit more to get that project underway. Um, and then finally, I'd like to, I'd like to give you a, a challenge. And the, cha <laughs> the challenge is this. We desperately need a review of the development and planned unit development regulations. Convene a task force, review the regulations, maybe they can come up with some things um, that could address a lot of the issues that the communities are currently facing. And, uh, you know, that's just a challenge, but we thank you very much for all the work you've done. Now, finally, I also <laughs> serve on the board of NeighborSpace, and yes, I have to do this. Um, we're hoping you can give us uh, continued funding for that so we can stay as a viable organization. As you know, we fill a niche that Rec and Parks doesn't really do. We respond to small, little community parks and help them develop and manage them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. That was a very efficient use of two minutes there. Um, I, I will just say on, on the uh, reviews, I, stay tuned for the master plan stuff. Um, I think you'll be interested in, in what is included in the master plan. Um, and then I do want to just give, Paul, I don't know if Director DeAndrea Walker is here to just give an update on Moore's Lane and or Route 743. Or Deputy Director Buckler. Good evening, Deputy Director Lauren Buckler with DPWT. Um, we are working hard on Moore's Lane. I recognize it's taken longer than most people would have wanted it to. It goes over some CSX tracks, so we have to coordinate really closely with the railroad. Um, what's holding it up at this point that we've passed the hurdle on is the stormwater. The railroad system determined that no rainwater can go from the bridge onto the train tracks. So we had to acquire extra property to drain the stormwater onto. So that's what we've been doing. So it looks like nothing's happening, but there's a lot happening behind the scenes. So we are almost at full design again because we had to redo the stormwater system. And we're hoping to move forward with construction in the near future. See, it's good. Even the, I even learned stuff at these town halls, so thank you, Lauren. And, and I want to thank Pat Keller. I was president of the Perry Hall Improvement Association for nine years. Anyone who's president of a community association, it's a thankless task. And I want to especially extend my appreciation to all of you who are here tonight. So thank you. Get my steps in. Speaking of steps, my name's Jake Eichenberg, and I am another local disc golf advocate. I wanted to share some of my experiences and some statistics on the sport as we think about increasing funding and partnering with the local community of disc golf players. So the disc golf community worldwide has reached over 1.2 million players who last year alone played over 19 million rounds of disc golf. From my personal experience, I covered more than 325 miles last year playing the sport. And my mother, who is 67, plays the sport loves it and has lost well over 20 pounds playing the sport in the last year. The, as stated earlier by Pete, there's one course in the county from a public perspective. There are two fantastic properties that have the opportunity to host world-class level courses. These are amazing green spaces that adding a course would not only increase public usage, but would also help sustain the green space. Thinking about two of the top three things that were showing up earlier on the Slido. We can do those simultaneously while leveraging existing dollars within the county budget for these spaces. And I look forward to seeing what these properties can become because they can, as Ben stated, bring forward young men and women in the area to success. We've seen multiple local businesses start up within the community in the county in the last couple of years, 
and we've seen a local 18-year-old phenom recently get signed by a top five worldwide manufacturer for sponsorship for the upcoming season. Thank you. I want to thank you. Hold on. There we go. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, my name is Dave Conrad. I'm a, ba a Baltimore County resident here in District 5, and I'm representing Bowley's Quarters Improvement Association this evening. Um, we are here to continue to advocate for some targeted funding for transportation improvements within our community. Um, our proposal covers a broad spectrum of goals, including uh, road widening, traffic calming, uh, sidewalk connectivity, stormwater management, and pedestrian safety um, within the Middle River area and specifically um, with our community. So um, we've been working over the past few months, um, uh, getting some feedback from the planning department, DPWT, um, and others. Um, I really want to thank, I know Director Lafferty was here, I don't know if uh, Director Russell is here, and some others, their staff, um, for um, helping keep the lines of communication open with us. Um, Emery's here as well. Again, these guys are really important for us to get this process forward, and they've been really helpful so far. Um, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Baltimore County and the staff for uh, continuing to help move this issue forward, and then just ask you for continued advocacy for the support of um, these projects and these improvements. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman Marks and his office for all the support he's provided for us um, up until this point, as well as uh, County Executive Oshevsky and his staff, uh, specifically Patrick, Zach, and uh, Director uh, Remmel for uh, their support with the Office of Community Engagement, just, again, helping us navigate this process and, uh, and get these goals moved forward as quickly as possible. So, thank you. Good evening, my name is Douglas Scarborough. I'm here to speak on behalf of the residents of the 2500 block of Harwood Road in Parkville. This block has historically had a significant water drainage problem, which recently with some increased development and widening of Joppa Road has become uh, very hazardous at times. Um, the county has come out several times and looked at it their latest repair in August of 22 uh, actually made the problem worse. There is more standing water than there was before uh, on the north side of the block. And for the first time since the repair, there is water bubbling up through the pavement on the south side of the block. The road today was a prime example in the rain the water is flowing out of the gutter pans on the north side and all the way across the road to the south side. The road was never sloped properly when it was built, which would have been, I believe, in the mid to late 50s. Over Christmas, during the extreme cold, the ice from the two sides almost met in the middle of the street. We as the residents are respectfully asking that the county consider a regrade of the road that would ensure proper drainage. Thank you. Good evening, County Executive Oseshki and uh, Councilman Marks, members of the administration. My name is Robert Thomas. I serve as the Vice President for Community and Government Relations with the White Mars Fire Company. It's my pleasure to address you this evening on behalf of President Palmer regarding our priorities and recommendations to your administration. First, we thank you for your ongoing support of public safety and especially the fire service in Baltimore County. White Marsh is one of the strongest volunteer organizations in the county, with more than 260 active volunteers, including 108 EMTs and paramedics. We are one of the busiest fire stations in the county. Our priorities are as follows. We need the spur ramp from the industrial road adjacent to the former GM plant to eastbound Maryland 43 completed as previously requested to aid in our emergency responses. <coughs> this was in the transportation priorities in the last four years, 
and we'd like to see this brought to fruition as quickly as possible. It's our understanding also that county government is tentatively proposing a 2% increase to, in funding to support the volunteer fire and EMS service. With all due respect, sir, a 2% increase is inadequate to meet the need, growing demands and needs and expenses incurred by the county volunteers. Furthermore, it is our understanding there's been no significant increase in funding to support the operation of county volunteers in more than four years, and we respectfully request the administration revisit this funding formula. Finally, White Marsh, as well as a number of other companies, support the need for increased county fire department instructors to support the ongoing training requirements for volunteers in the county. Training is not a one and done venture. Volunteers and career personnel must continually train in order to better respond to mitigate the myriad of hazards we face on a daily basis. In closing, White Marsh thanks you for your support of public safety. We welcome you and members of your administration to visit our station at any time to see firsthand how we serve the White Marsh and Nottingham communities. Thank you very much. For thank, thank you, Robert. I really like your gym. I've had a chance to work out there once or twice, so thank you guys for hosting us as part of the visit. Absolutely. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you. I'm Tom Grimroth, and my father and my wife's father worked at the Glen O. Martin plant during the Second World War. Glen O. Martin was well known as an aeronautical genius and aviation pioneer. He taught the others how to build airplanes. He provided a significant impact also in the aerospace industry. The Glen o. Martin Manufacturing Company really built Essex and Middle River and the surrounding neighborhoods. The Aviation Museum has a world-class collection of artifacts and a world-class collection of airplanes. I highly urge you to do everything possible to assist the Glen L. Martin Aviation Museum in establishing a facility that will allow them to display their considerable and historically significant collection. It will certainly become a national tourist destination as others have and thus provide significant economic impact into our area. Please help the museum to obtain a proper facility. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chief Shannon Stallings of the Bowley's Quarters Volunteer Fire Department in Bowley's Quarters. Talking to it. Come here tonight asking you for your consideration in assisting in improving the infrastructure for the two volunteer fire companies that you've recently inherited into the 5th District. Uh, volunteer fire companies in Baltimore County can save taxpayers up to $2.2 million annually uh, based on some recent studies depending on the individual companies. And while I could speak in many ways for both of us, I only have statistics and, and uh, information for Bowley's Quarters. So Bowley's Quarters has a highly dependable response rate. We've never once required an immediate backup of dispatch from a neighboring station due to poor performance. <clears throat> we cover 11 square miles of land, 90 square miles of the Upper Chesapeake Bay with our Marine Division, and we do that with 47 first responders and 59 support services and auxiliary members. Our current station is in a 100-year floodplain. We have three buildings varying in age, the oldest being 77 years. <clears throat> Over $400,000 is needed in repairs or upgrades to either stay relevant or become NFPA compliant with today's standards, and this does not include major structural flood considerations. We are no longer centralized in the high demands in the growing areas of our community. Essentially, we've put a series of band-aids year after year on our structures. So to be proactive, the Bowley's Quarter Volunteer Fire Department has acquired just under 12 acres of land at the corner of Carroll Island and Bowley's Quarters Roads. This is a prime location to serve the existing primary territory. It will decrease response times into Chase, Middle River, Essex, and White Marsh when they request support. And it'll be the primary company to propose developments such as Lafarge and CP Crane. Our unique challenges lie in us being in a critical bay area of LDA. We have greater upfront costs for civil engineering and site work. We're expected to spend up to $100,000 just to get preliminary construction approvals because of the sensitive nature of our property. 
the Bowie Schoolers Volunteer Fire Department will be formally requesting up to $500,000 in subsidy or in-kind services to bring our new station to Shovel Ready. We expect $225,000 to be the minimum cost needed to reach our goals during the fiscal year 24 period budget and the balance by the close of fiscal 25. The BQVFD has provided a stellar service to Eastern Baltimore County for over 75 years, and your support and infrastructure is necessary for us to continue for the next 75. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. And, and Chief, thank you for, um, for hosting us when we had the announcement about the additional equipment. It was great to be with you and, and the members that day. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Carla Vigil. Good evening, my name is Carla Vigil. Y soy una mamá de un niño con necesidades especiales y vengo representando a, a las madres hispanas que tienen niños con necesidades especiales para que puedan, por favor, eh, Good evening, I'm a mother of a child with special needs, and I'm here representing Hispanic mothers like myself. Vengo a solicitar si por favor pueden incluir un poco más de dinero en el presupuesto para esta área, para nuestros niños. I'm here to ask that you consider adding additional funding to schools serving children in this area. Y para que por favor puedan dar más capacitación también a los padres para que trabajen en conjunto con las escuelas para que nuestros niños puedan en el futuro eh, ser buenos ciudadanos. I would also ask to, I would also like to ask that you add additional funding so that parents like myself can receive training and preparation so that they can help their children, so that their children can excel and be better citizens. Sí, y muchas veces en las escuelas la limitación siempre es el inglés. Por favor, pueden poner eh, en las escuelas personas en, profesionales, intérpretes, pero en persona, no por teléfono. One of our limitations is that often language is a barrier. I would like to ask that you include in your budget additional funding for not just language inter line interpretation, but additional interpreters that are in person to assist families with limited English proficiency. Sí, nuestros niños con necesidades especiales son geniales, son genios. Cada, cada niño es especial. Our children with special needs are geniuses. They're brilliant children that need support. Mi niño tiene tres años. Sabe escribir su nombre. Y lo único que yo pido, por favor, que que incluyan más terapeutas de eh, terapia ocupacional, terapia de habla. My child is three years old and he can speak, but I want to ask you that you add additional funding so that he can receive additional therapies so that he can continue to improve. Lastimosamente no se sabe qué, qué está pasando. Mi hijo mi pequeño tiene autismo, no se sabe por qué. My youngest child has autism, and we don't know what's going to happen. Gracias a Dios, él recibe terapia, pero la verdad, entre más temprano los niños con necesidades especiales son diagnosticados, pueden ellos progresar porque la, entre más temprano se, se diagnostique y se le ayude a un niño Va, va a necesitar en el futuro menos ayuda. Es importante ayudar, ayudar los pequeños para que en el futuro no sean una carga. It's really important that we assist young children with early diagnosis. The earlier we diagnose kids with needs, the earlier that they can get treatment, the earlier that they can begin to improve, the earlier their families can know how to help them, the earlier that we can help them 
so that they can help themselves in the future and that they're not a charge or a burden. Muchas gracias. Por favor, tómenlo en cuenta, de verdad. Los niños con necesidades especiales son únicos y cada uno es especial. Thank you so much. Please consider my request. Our special needs students need your support because they are children with special needs, but they are also brilliant young people. Thank you. Your, your son is amazing, and we will do all that we can to make sure he has all the help that he needs. Good evening, Councilman Marks and uh, County Executive Olszewski. Uh, I echo what VP Thomas from White Marsh and Chief Stallings have to say about their companies as well. Um, our first two areas not as big as some others, uh, so we struggle to get some of our funding. Um, some of our funding has been a struggle the past few years. Uh, we have COVID, supply chain issues, and uh, inflation that drive up costs on us. Um, County funding has not increased in, uh, in subsidies and operating grants in a while. Um, that uh, hurts us with the same dollars as five, ten years ago is now. Um, costs keep our apparatus on a street alone is uh, increasing. Uh, we have $8,000 to work with a year on that. I currently have a bill for $14,000 just to put brakes all the way around one of my units, not alone to do the DOTs or the uh, preventive maintenance that's required every year. Um, fire department under chief fund does a fantastic job of reallocating funds that are extra at the end of the year for companies that do need help. So I appreciate uh, chief fund on that. Um, we're just looking for the county, uh, looking into increasing some of the funding for the volunteers. Thank you. I don't, chief Runder, are you here tonight? I don't know if you, if you want to add anything. Um, in addition to, to looking at that, which we're happy to do, um, just for the benefit of um, the, the crowd, um, we were proud to partner. Uh, we used a million dollars of our American Rescue funding to do a direct grant to um, our volunteer stations based on their um, low SAT points, which is basically the amount of service and time that's been put through the stations. Uh, worked with Chief Run to put in, as I mentioned, the second set of turnout gear. Uh, we increased our medic attended pay um, for the first time. I know it was a long-standing request, but Chief, you want to just sort of generally talk about our partnership and our appreciation of our volunteer stations. Absolutely. Um, for any of the other volunteers that are here, most of you I've already saw, spoke to you and said thank you. I think they know. I truly appreciate them. They work very hard at what they do, and they do that in addition to their full-time jobs um, every day. So. The fire department works very, very diligently with them to make sure that we do everything we can to provide them the resources that they need. However, as everyone knows, budgets always have limitations, and we work very close with our wonderful budget director as well. Thank you. Um, and the county executive and the county council um, as well. And we're very thankful for all the support that they give us. And we have to work within the realms of what taxes provide and what our citizens can afford as well. So please know that they do have great needs and they do provide a tremendous service to the citizens um, and your communities on a daily basis. Um, and every time that you can support them, please, please, please step out there and do so because we're gonna do so from the administration. So boss, I hope I met your expectations, sir. <laughs> Kirk, we're getting your steps in the night, buddy. Boss, I'm meeting your expectations, brother. Hello, I'm Alan Robertson, friend. I'm representing the Bullies Quarters Community Association. I'm also a member of the Gunpowder Valley Conservancy, and we support them. And we also throw our support behind the Bullies Quarters Volunteer Fire Department. We would like to have funding for the museum at Martin's. My father also happened to have worked at Martin's way back in the day. 
and that all has already been addressed. So what I want to primarily address is the crane power plant property. That needs to be funded because this is one of the most sensitive areas on the Baltimore County shoreline. It's surrounded by two tidal creeks and it's adjacent to the Chesapeake Bay. The only reason why the power plant was there in the first place is it was built when the bay, before the bay was polluted and we didn't need to do all the conservation we have today. Once we put in the zoning and the urdle, something like that would have never have happened, but it was allowed to continue through exception. Their argument that this is better than the power plant is true, but even the power plant or what they are recommending should not be on this property. This is one of the most sensitive areas in Baltimore County. It's a much easier to avoid pollution than it is to try and come back and fix it. So let's put the money in up front rather than come back in 10 years and say, here's how the pollution's coming into Seneca Creek and Saltpeter Creek, and how do we try to fix all that area? What we also want to look at is the building exceptions. The exception for the building, there's no need for exceptions anymore. Let's go with what we have in place. This property is, uh, should be purchased and added to uh, the current, I can't think of the name of it, at the Nature Center. You already have the structure to manage and control the property. You don't have to create something new. So it's already part of an existing larger plan that's going to be helpful to the community. So between that and the property for Lockheed Martin, I'd like the people who support this to please stand up or hold up their signs to show support for this. Thank you very much. While you're counting, I hope to be able to come back here in three or four years and thank you, like Pat Keller did, for funding this property and purchasing it. It beats the alternative, trust me. I learned in this job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you all. Good evening. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Charlotte Baker, and I am here representing one of the biggest growing sports in our nation, which is pickleball. <laughs> we are in need of additional courts in uh, Baltimore County, um, indoor and outdoor. We would like something with restrooms, lighting for evening play, and permanent need, permanent nets. Um, Pickleball is one of those sports that also presents a lot of health um, benefits to our seniors and our young. Um, social, uh, promotes um, social gatherings, um, bridges the gaps between the young and the old. Our oldest member that um, I'm aware of right now is 91. Um, the school systems are now offering pickleball as a sport. So what we would like to encourage Baltimore County to do is develop more pickleball courts. Um, the cost of resurfacing um, anywhere from $3,600 to $5,500, taping on a new net, $330. The cost of a basic court with fencing and lighting, like $22,000. So this will be greatly benefit beneficial to our community as we grow. Um, with those, those people that are here that represent and play the sport, please stand. <laughs> All right, pickleball. Are those pickleball bat paddles I see? Were they? Wow. Say, if we didn't have to be respectful and get out of here, we could do a little impromptu game on the gym floor. <laughs> but. Okay, I have to say this, because I've never said it to him first. Yakshi Mash, Johnny. That's a little Polish for everybody. My name is Al Muehlberger, and I'm advocating for all the seniors in this room, as well as in Baltimore County. The reason I say that, there is a Commission on Aging, by the way, of which I am one of his appointees. And there's a representative for every councilmanic district, which gives you another avenue of expressing your needs and concerns through that elected official. 
I'm also a member of something called the Maryland Senior Citizens Hall of Fame. This past Tuesday, I was appointed to their executive board. Last year, I won the top award for a volunteer in Maryland as a senior. The reason I'm bringing that up is if you're a senior in this room and you're probably volunteering for somebody, go to that organization. You can get nomination forms, not necessarily for yourself, but maybe for a friend, because as I'm being on that board, I'll be able to select the winner. The point is, for last year, Baltimore County was very well represented. The other thing is the Baltimore County Department of Aging. We thanks for all the support you gave for infrastructure. And of course, they're growing, as you know, those centers. And so more support's gonna be needed in the future. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is congratulations again for creating the position of an immigration affairs coordinator. She's not gonna like me saying this, but she came to Seven Oaks and did a great presentation on immigration here in Baltimore County as well as national policy. And she's to be congratulated for that effort. Our support is that needs to spread. But I think she's only got a half person helping her, is it? We're a full, one full. Okay, anyway, so Juliana Valencia Bank has done a great job so far. And finally, one more thing. You used the slide up there that said STEAM, the acronym is Science, Technology, Electronics. And math, I'm glad you put the A in there for arts, because the world does not just exist for mechanical and electronic reasons. Don't give up on the arts. Thank you. I actually think that I forget to mention that we also have, um, Director Riley, are you here? Um, I don't give you an, enough an op of an opportunity. We added some part-time we added some like staff in the last year's budget too because because of the growth in our senior centers. Um, so if you would just touch on that and then maybe the the funding for our gyms ac across the county that there's gonna be access to new treadmills and other stuff for our seniors. Yes, thank you to your generosity in the budget of the county council as well. We added one additional- It's not my generosity, it's the <laughs> generosity of the residents of Baltimore the residents County of with the support generosity. of Councilman Marks and his colleagues. We added an additional staff person to each of our senior centers. So our larger centers now have an additional half-time person and our smaller centers have an additional full-time person. We have fitness centers in 14 of our senior centers and we've just up, we are in the process of upgrading the equipment in all of those. And now that you have one membership in a fitness center, you can go to any of those across the county. The, the other thing that I would add is that with 25% of our population senior citizens, we've tried to do more to encourage uh, housing to accommodate their needs. Um, Pat Keller spoke earlier. We worked together to make sure that the Gerst Farm development is 100% senior restricted. We advanced Brightview, and we need more of that type of housing, which doesn't overburden our schools. So that's definitely going to continue to be a priority for me. Hello, my name is Chris Eisenach from Bauer Avenue in Perry Hall, um, representing myself and my neighbors. Uh, thank you for staying up past your bedtime, appreciate that. Uh, but we've got a, a drainage issue, uh, just like the gentleman was speaking of a few minutes ago. Um, we do have ice that covers the street uh, when it actually gets cold in February. Uh, but it happened uh, Christmas Eve, um, that's why I reached out. I've uh, been reaching out the past several years, working with uh, Department of Public Works to try to get some funding there. I know curbs and gutters are quite expensive, uh, six-figure range, uh, but maybe there's a compromise somewhere in the middle that'll actually connect drainage to um, the drain on the other side of Clausmeyer, right behind the mechanic shop, uh, which might be a good option. I know uh, Nick from Public Works was looking at that. Uh, but it's just time to make the investment with the uh, busy street on Clausmeyer, with that red light that's really been picking up there. Uh, and the traffic goes further back. Uh, to my knowledge, there has not been an accident there from the ice but I don't want to be talking about it afterwards. Um, so uh, just uh, big thanks for the rapid response times from uh, Mr. Marks, uh, your office, uh, making our community still feel, still feel small. I appreciate that. Uh, I know it is crowded and there's a lot of us here, uh, but I just want to keep our neighborhood safe, keep our families safe, uh, and I appreciate your time, um, and I appreciate being part of a community where this many people are involved. Oh, so I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Heather Patty, and I'm the president of the White Marsh Cowanton Community Association. 
And first of all, I want to say it feels great to be represented by uh, David Marks again. He has uh, always been very uh, re receptive to our needs, and it's great to be represented again. So a few things, I'm going to condense 10 minutes into two minutes, I'll do my best. I uh, want to draw your attention to the inequity in access to health care between the eastern, western, and northern central parts of Baltimore County. This information is from the 2020 census. The uh, central and northern Baltimore County is served mainly by St. Joe's and GBMC with a total licensed hospital beds of uh, 481. The ratio of licensed hospital beds per resident is one hospital bed per 600 residents. In eastern Baltimore County, which is served primarily by Franklin Square, uh, 328 to 338 beds, depending on the source, which gives us one hospital bed per 891 to 865, depending on the source. Western Baltimore County really doesn't have a hospital in the county. They're served primarily by city hospitals, St. Agnes or Sinai, so we're sending uh, 273,000 residents to city hospitals. So um, I performed a similar analysis in 2015 using 2010 census data, and we went in Eastern County from one hospital bed to 600 residents to now we're at one to 891. So it's dangerous, it's very dangerous, and I would like to uh, respectively request that we look at health care access for Baltimore County because I'm hearing complaints from community members of ER wait times of 8 to 10 to 12 hours or more. And I would like you to, <laughs> I didn't even get to everything, but I would like you to consider that with uh, growing development that we need to look at infrastructure for hospitals. And um, also a new medic unit at White Marsh Volunteer Fire Department, I'll be really brief. There are other vehicles available to help with um, patient care, but there's only one vehicle to transport to the hospital. White Marsh did request another medic unit, but this request was denied. And some residents have reported waiting up to 40 minutes for ambulance transport. So strokes and heart attacks. I was a critical care nurse for over 20 years. It's very important with strokes and heart attacks that they get to the hospital for, strokes are usually clots. TPA can break a clot up, but there's a small window of time, and if they don't get to the hospital, they could face disability or death. It's very important. So if, if White Marsh Medic Unit is covering in Parkville or Woodlawn or Essex or Sparrows Point, and, and they have to wait, they can't take the patient in the engine or the, the truck, the pickup truck, you know, a million, a three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for a medic unit is a drop in the bucket compared to loss of life or a lawsuit for loss of life. And then, just real quick, we talked about code enforcement already. I won't go there. Funding for stream cleanups. We have about a dumpster worth of trash in White Marsh Run, and I was told by the county that they don't currently have a program to clear streams of trash and the community is expected to clean that up. We don't know where it's coming from. We do community cleanups and we're expected to clean it up. And police department, we haven't had a police department since 1987 with all the development. We, we need an infrastructure. Thank you. Oh, I can't see this. Um, I'll try and be brief. Uh, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Alan said. He's, he's from Bully's Quarters. I'm from Seneca Park. My name is Bonnie Jasinski, um, Vice President of the Seneca Park Improvement Association and a lifelong resident of Seneca Park. I'd just like to voice our support to earmark open space funding to conserve 138.15 acres zoned RC5 and 20 in the Chesapeake Bay critical area also designated Royal Legacy Area. This site is formerly known as the CP Crane site, obviously. Um, I feel like the administration has an opportunity to be a part of reversing the damage done by a um, dirty coal-fired power plant um, by conserving this environmentally sensitive area and allowing it to revert back to forest and wetlands rather than burden our roads, our infrastructure with additional development. This is a site where green energy could be, 
could be produced via battery storage where infrastructure is already existing. This is, in my opinion, saving the best of what's left by expanding and connecting the green belt around the Chesapeake Bay, our greatest natural resource. Um, there have been um, substantial conservation efforts made in our community in the last 10 years. Um, there's a forest mitigation bank and rural legacy land that borders the south side of this site, um, a non-title mitigation bank across the street from the site, and rural legacy land on the north side of the site. And these are all carrying protective covenants and easements. And it's so much more important to the environment when these hubs are connected and we create this green belt. Um, I think this could be a win for the administration and definitely a win for the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Johnson. I'm the vice president of Campbell Cross and Homeowners Association. Um, one thing I've learned here tonight is that I need to get into pickleball and disc golf. <laughs> um, I just want to thank uh, Johnny O and uh, Councilman Marks for having this meeting, and I'll be brief. Uh, one of my concerns is with the forest conservation areas, green spaces that we aren't allowed to touch, when trees are starting to lean over and things like that and they need to be cut down, those costs are being uh, passed over to the HOA to handle. And we were wondering if maybe Department of Public Works or something could maybe start responding to those and cutting those trees down. We know we got to leave them there, can't touch it, but for every tree that needs to get cut down, it's costing us probably like five, $600. And when your new community and the HOA fees are already high and that just adds, we have to increase fees every year. Uh, the second issue is Campbell Boulevard and Bird River Road. It was just open, thank you. I'll be happy when the other side opens too. But there has been accidents there time and time again. Uh, there's an online petition that has been started to maybe do uh, better stop signs, even some stop signs that flash, light up. Uh, I know a traffic circle might be out of the mix right now because it costs a lot of money. But if there's anything that you could do to help us, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Abe. Um, I think Deputy Director Buckler is the person to connect with on the um, intersection. Uh, Lauren, if you just want to get up and wave again, and then um, I know I saw uh, Brady Locker. I don't know if Dave Likens is here, but Brady, I think you're on. If, I don't know if you can speak to like if our or 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 Lauren about sort of our varying divisions, if there might be an opportunity to partner, especially with our new forestry stuff. So. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Brady Locker. I'm the Deputy Director, Environmental Protection and Sustainability. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> um, but for forest conservation areas uh, where we have easements, uh, we're trying to protect the forest. Even a downed uh, tree actually provides habitat and in a healthy forest. But we don't want dangerous trees falling on property. So if you have an easement uh, with a tree that's fallen down, we don't want anyone getting hurt. Contact us. We'll work with you, and we'll work on getting uh, either somebody out there to remove the tree if it's a danger of falling on an adjacent property or uh, make an assessment of whether it needs to be um, taken down inside the easement as well. Y'all heard that, right? You got a card? Yeah, 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 absolutely. He's got a card. That's why they're here. Yes, sir. All right. Good evening. My name's Jim Hawk. I'm president of Bullies Quarters Improvement Association. Tonight, I'm asking the county to allocate $4 million towards the purchase of that 157 acres formerly known as C.P. Crane. The property is located on the Chesapeake Bay critical areas, and on top of that, all three sides of it are zoned RC20, including the property owned by Baltimore County, which has now just been redesigned to be created wetlands. Along with that, the purchase of the property will allow connectivity not only to Marshy Point, but it'll start at Gunpowder State Park through Marshy Point, through C.P. Crane to Eastern Regional. It connects four parks together by having that property. On top of that, what you have to look at is the power lines are already there from BGE and the railroad tracks, which will remove the railroad tracks. And we've already worked with the uh, owners of the property to make sure that can happen and BGE. And that will give you your trails, your bike and your uh, walking, hiking trails, which is very important. 
It's going to require four million from the county. It's going to require state money to purchase the whole property and federal money, which we're also working with the state. And David's been working with both state and federal, and we appreciate what David's done. Uh, on top of that, this is the opportunity to protect the property here and looking forward, uh, even though it's zoned RC5 and RC20. And if you look at this drawing, this is the second drawing. <clears throat> the first property is going to put a 400-pound land piece of property. It is zoned RC5 and RC20. And the reason that it's from the 75, from the 400. So, and last but not least, those homes, if you look at it, are going to be built within 50 feet of the water. That's nowhere in Baltimore County do they allow that kind of thing, but there is just by right they're saying they can do that in other words, the plant was built. With that, I'd just like to have all those in support of the county purchasing it with the $4 million. <laughs> And thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Jim, and, every, every, and everyone who believes in this. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Raymond Peel. I'm the HOA president for the Preserves at Windless Run, which is located off of Campbell Boulevard between Route 43 and the Bird River Road intersection. I come, with you, I come to you with great concern as the HOA president. When the roadway opened up back in July of 2020, I reached out to a previous council member that produced negative results, who then passed me off to somebody from Baltimore County Transportation, and in short told me the road was built, the, the major roadway was built and intended for the function of serving commuter and emergency services, and we're not allowed to put any traffic calming devices there. Call the police, they'll help. I was able to read the Baltimore County website information regarding the Baltimore County Department of Public Works neighborhood trafficking management program and it caught my attention and I quote, the neighborhood traffic management program for residential street represents the community of Baltimore County to promote and maintain the safety and livability of the county's residential neighborhoods. As congestions along the roadway network has grown in frequency, magnitude and duration, resourceful motorists have found bypass routes through local residential streets. Aggressive driving and diminished respect for other motorists, pedestrians, traffic control devices and general, roads of the, general rules of the road have become more common. Increased traffic volumes and vehicular speeds have negatively impacted the livability of many residential communities. On July 20 of 2020, a 62-year-old grandmother was walking along a Baltimore County roadway with her five-year-old granddaughter at 6.30 in the morning where both of them were killed. The community had begged and pleaded since 1985 for 35 years to do something about that roadway, and it wasn't until the fatal crash took place that Baltimore County installed stop signs in a median island. Since 1985, a little girl's life had to be lost in order for Baltimore County to do something. The preserves is a very active community, but no one feels safe. I can give you a few incidents. Vehicles are flying past school buses. They're losing control and wrecking in the yards of the, ro of the houses that are on Campbell Boulevard. We've had trees being taken out. And at nighttime, it's consistent drag racing up and down, County, up, up and down Campbell. Mr. Executive, I'm coming to you as the voice of the community, as an active law enforcement officer and someone who really loves the active, vibrant community in which I live in. We owe it to the residents to put measures in place and we'll keep everyone safe while enjoying this community each and every day. I am pleading for this innocent, I'm pleading for your citizens in county and putting traffic control devices along Campbell Boulevard in some way and maybe doing something about that Bird River Road and Campbell Boulevard exit, uh, Bird River Road uh, intersection. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you, and thank you for thank your you service. Um, we'll make sure, um, Deputy Director Butler, if you could just make sure um, Mr. Peel gets your information so we can make sure that uh, it's elevated to, to our offices and the top of the department for you. So we'll take a look at it. Thank you. Uh, I want to get, see that gentleman get his wish to pick up pickleball and disc golf. And Charlotte did a wonderful job talking about pickleball and advocating for that. And a few people talk about disc golf. I'd like to see Dave Cove 
have a, a, a disc golf course uh, around an indoor pickleball facility. He can put questions at one place. Pretty young. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to come and advocate for uh, the county development expand opportunities for citizens uh, to participate in pickleball. My name is Chad Casterly. I'm a lifelong resident of Baltimore County. I retired from uh, Baltimore County government, worked in the Commission on Disability the Department of Aging. Uh, I have a master's degree in recreation. Uh, pickleball has helped me maintain a degree of mobility, flexibility, and coordination in my retirement years, even if my playing partners might not agree. Uh, <laughs> It provides me with the opportunity to socialize and meet new and diverse friends. I just want to point out some reasons why, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I'm not talking clear. Uh, reasons the county should expand facilities. One, uh, contrary to what pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the county, in the country, there's a need for increased and safe spaces to play, given increased popularity here in Baltimore County. Uh, pickleball can be a lifelong uh, healthy sport activity that can be enjoyed from youth through senior years. Uh, unlike football and other youth sports, uh, many, many middle, middle schools are also taking that up. Uh, it can be a family and intergenerational activity, which Charlotte pointed out before is good. Uh, I, I enjoy playing with my grandchildren. Uh, at least, uh, anyhow, wheelchair users and people with disabilities are now starting to participate in it. Uh, store up and equipment is relatively inexpensive. It's easy to learn, fun to play. However, it continues to be challenging uh, to improve your skills if you want to set your goal. However, there's always a fun activity to be played. Uh, and I guess I, my time's up, so I'll get the book here. Uh, but anyhow, I'll pass the rest of it to you. Okay. Uh, and also, when the facility is built for the indoor football, I, I think it'd be a good idea to have the opening ceremony. His executive office uh, played a tournament against the council office. Hi, I'm Joe Neely Kruger. I'm a resident of Middle River. I live right here on the Bird River Road. I also suggest you get punch cards because this is my fourth town hall. So come on. <laughs> Do I get credit? Um, I come to you every town hall with the same thing. In this area, we have built thousands upon thousands of houses and put in so many roadways. What I ask for every time is open space, parks, and fields. We have gotten none of those. We have no parks where we can just walk with walking trails. We have not added any ball fields, soccer fields, lacrosse fields, you know, cricket fields, nothing. We have added nothing to our area. So we ask all these people to come to Middle River, and I don't know what we're giving them. And it's getting very frustrating because a lot of our youth in our area are going over to Perry Hall White Marsh for their sports. And you know, I had someone from there tell me that our kids are making it much more difficult on them because now they have a surplus of kids and they have to accommodate all of them. So I do ask that we please, please, please look into something for our area. And also, what Nick and Ray were saying about Bird River Road in Campbell, years ago, I'm on the board for Bird River Road Neighborhood Association. At one of our meetings, somebody came from traffic, and when we asked them for a circle, they told us it was too expensive, there wasn't enough space, and that they would have to move poles. So then we asked them for a light, and they said no, that the traffic sign would be sufficient. It is not sufficient, we've had multiple accidents, and uh, somebody hit a bus in the bar flipped over not long ago. I had called the county, and they put me from person to person to person. The last person finally told me, that is a traffic enforcement issue, call the police. It's not. We need something there because someone is going to get killed. It's not an if, it's a when at this point. 